This lecture is going to be on the work of Paul Feyerabend, in particular his book Against Method. Feyerabend, like pretty much all post-Kuhnian philosophers, is responding to Kuhn, and he's going to be agreeing with some things, disagreeing with others. But one of the things that really makes Feyerabend stand out is that he is one of the more sort of challenging and eccentric thinkers uh, in the later 20th century philosophy of science. Um, for example, he, he actually did not like to be called a philosopher, even though he very clearly was trained in philosophy, worked in philosophy departments. He also had a bunch of other uh, j uh, jobs, including various kinds of performance art. Uh, and when asked what he did, he, he said that he actually wasn't a philosopher. He described himself as an entertainer, and his writing is indeed very, very entertaining. And he's in some ways kind of difficult to read because it's not always clear he actually means what he says. If I was going to compare him to anyone else in the history of philosophy, it would probably be Friedrich Nietzsche. Both Nietzsche and Feyerabend, I think, can fairly be described as wild men who are very interested in provoking people, very interested in getting a rise out of people. And in the service of that, they sometimes will say things that they don't mean. Um, this can sort of make both Nietzsche and Feyerabend seem like trolls in the modern vernacular, but they're, if, if so, they are trolls for, for a good cause. They're trolls to get to ch challenge people and to get people to think in new ways. They're not simply trying to upset people for the sake of upsetting them. Uh, they are trying to accomplish something in this with, with this attitude of, of, of uh, provocateurship. Um, the book Against Method actually originally was going to be a point counterpoint book with Emir Lakatos, who I talked about in the last lecture. It was going to be called For and Against Method. Lakatos was going to argue for method. Feyerabend was going to argue against method, but sadly Lakatos died before he wrote his half of the book, so Feyerabend simply uh, published his half as against method. Um, and as I say, it's a very provocative book. I highly recommend picking it up. Now, uh, the, the view that Feyerabend endorses has been described as epistemological anarchism, uh, which is, uh, again, you can see right there the, how provocative uh, uh, his, his thinking is going to be. Uh, but what does he mean by this? What does, it, what does it mean to describe a view as epistemological anarchism? In short, again, as the title of the book suggests, what he's saying is that science should not limit itself to any particular set of methods. Science should have no rules at all. Anything goes. Um, uh, science works best, he thinks, when it's unencumbered, uninhibited, and scientists are allowed to, 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 to explore things in ways that, uh, that any some sort of method might otherwise constrain them from doing. And his basic argument for, the, for this position goes something like this. You name a method, you name any method that you want that you say is the way that science ought to be done, whether that be sort of an, an empirical method or a logical method or a mathematical method or a, a, a social method. You, you, you name whatever method or set of methods that you want, and he will find a case in the history of science where if those rules had been followed as you, as you have outlined them, some important discovery would not have been made. He thinks what you learn when you study the history of science is that there are there is no way of creating an algorithm or or, or, or a set formula that scientists always follow to come about their dis discoveries. Um, and so for, for him, again, you can see here, again, like all post kuhnian philosophers, he's taking the importance of the history of science to be at the heart and center of his work. But uh, in, in a much more sort of radical way than even radical Kuhn, what what Feyerabend is saying here is that we should think of science like art, that is to say, as a form of human creativity. There is no way you can sort of make an algorithm that de deter will determine art. I mean, yes, you can make programs that will paint paintings, of course, but you can't make pro make a program that will paint, uh, that will be able to dictate the future of, of the art world, uh, uh, that will be able to tell you exactly where the art trends are going to go next, because human beings uh, always like sort of to defy stereotypes. When you're when you're given a method, uh, many much much of the time, great art comes from sort of defying those methods and rejecting the previous rules for how art should be done. And Feyerabend thinks that the history of science reveals a very, very similar pattern. The greatest scientists are the ones who break the rules, the ones who don't do what their predecessors say you should do in order to achieve science, in order to achieve ob you know, objectivity. And he thinks objectivity is actually highly overrated in science. Rather than striving for objectivity, science needs to be radically subjective. We need to see into the minds and the souls of people like Galileo and Einstein. And what we, and what we see when, when, we, when we do that uh, is is we, we come to understand how this sort of rebel spirit is really what fundamentally drives the great advances in science. 
Now, uh, like I say, it, it's, uh, it's, it's worth contrasting Fly Robin with Coon because everyone in this period is responding to Coon. Um, and there's several points of agreement that Fly Robin has with Coon. So, so for starters, and probably most obviously, the Coon's point about the incommensurability of paradigms. You know, that, that, that people working in a Newtonian paradigm are fundamentally just talking a different language than people working in an Einsteinian paradigm. Uh, 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 that basic idea from Kuhn is something that, that, that uh, Fly Robin picks up with and runs with. Uh, I've talked previously in this lecture series about the theory ladenness of perception, about how theory sort of conditions what it is that you see. If you, if you are working under one theory, you will experience things differently than if you're working thing under a, a different theory. Fly Robin takes this to the extreme. He doesn't just say that perception is theory laden. He says perception is theory determined, that uh, uh, the, the, the theory tells you what it is that you are allowed to see. And if you don't have the right theory, you will see the world in a completely different way. You will, you, you, you might remember from chapter 10 of Kuhn's uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he talked about how when a, when a paradigm shifts, literally the whole world changes. Fly Robin is saying something similar here. He's not saying so much that the world changes, but, but everything about how you see the world changes. Um, and so it, it's, it, it's, it's a very sort of rigid way of understanding the, the relationship between theory and perception. Now, whereas Kuhn tried to minimize the idea of, of, of scientific method, uh, so there really is no sort of single overarching scientific method, but that's okay because we can trust the scientific community, um, uh, Feyerabend uh, thinks that that second step is a mistake. Feyerabend also wants to minimize method. In fact, actually wants to go a step further. He wants to completely eliminate the idea of scientific method, but not because he trusts the scientific community. He actually thinks the scientific community kind of is, can be just as stultifying and, and uh, inhibiting as, as any other kind of community when it starts to become sort of stale and stodgy. What, what Fire Robin trusts is scientific genius. He, he trusts the people who, are, who have the ability to break, break the mold and to see things in a radically different way. Uh, uh, people who, are, who, who can transcend the dominant paradigm, who can transcend what it is that they've been taught and educated um, and, and, then, and raise the bar and, 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 and see the world in a completely different way and then teach the rest of us how to see the world in a completely different way. That's what's so inspiring about science for Fire Robin. So Lakatosh in the previous lecture had criticized Kuhn for making science too chaotic, for, uh, for, for sort of, again, making science all about mob psychology. Fire Robin thinks the opposite is true. Fire Robin thinks that Kuhn is actually a champion of drudgery. Uh, his whole defense of normal science, you know, science under the, the auspices of a particular paradigm, where, where the scientists go into the lab and they do these same step-by-step -step procedures, day in, day out, this sort of dull drudge work, which is something that Fire Robin thinks is just kind of so Soul crushing. That's something for thoughtless drones. I mean, maybe there is a, there's room for it. Perhaps maybe we actually do need that. But that's not the thing that we should champion. That's not what's awesome about science. What's awesome about science is precisely the radicals and the revolutionaries. It's the people who put their careers on the line, their reputations on the line, for an idea that's so crazy and out there that their colleagues look at them and think, you are insane for endorsing this. And they go forward anyway, and then they end up completely transforming the history of scientific thought. That's what's awesome and inspiring about scientists. The great scientists are like great artists. You know, they're, they're the ones who, who, who completely show us what we, we didn't realize art could do before. Um, and, and the scientists show us uh, ways in which we could look at the world, which we never realized we could look at the world before. Normal scientists are like the guys who sort of paint copies of Andy Warhol's. You know, they, they, they go in and they, they to the museum and they, they, they take out their sketch pads. And it's, it's not that there isn't something of value in that. It's not that there, there isn't something worth uh, or, or acknowledging in that kind of work. But that's that's not what's awesome about art. Um, so if, if, if great scientists are like the Beatles, normal scientists are like a cover band, you know? Again, it, it, that's not to diss cover bands as such. You know, there's, there's value in cover bands. But we should not confuse the awesomeness of the Beatles with, the, uh, with, with what sort of limited value there might be in a cover band. So uh, th this brings us to, again, again the, the, sort of the heart of what he's trying to get at in his book Against Method. Now, I want to sort of say a little bit about his uh, sort of, uh, pre uh, uh, he makes some disclaimers at the beginning of the book, which are worth focusing on. Uh, so one of the things that he warns his readers straight up is that he often will say things that he doesn't believe. Um, he does this because he wants to show uh, that he can lead people by the nose in a rational way. Uh, so he's, he's cautioning you to be on your guard here. Um, and like I say, I think this puts him in a good 
and sort of philosophic uh, spirit along with people like Nietzsche, arguably even Socrates who wanted to be the gadfly. Um, uh, uh, Paul Feyerabend here is trying to sort of be the gadfly of 20th century philosophy of science. Now, he doesn't do this just because it's fun, although it is fun. Again, I do think that, you know, if you, if you sort of, if you're a little in on the joke and you sort of treat Feyerabend's own pronouncements with a skeptical eye, you can appreciate it on, on, on at least two separate levels. Um, but you know, what he, he does this because he wants to sort of show people that we shouldn't take reason too seriously. Um, and again, this is something I think when you study the history of philosophy in general, you do see that people can sort of become dogmatic. People can uh, take what looks like a rational position and they take it to extremes. And then, you know, their, their antithesis is also taking what looks like a rational position. And they take it to extremes and you get people sort of uh, uh, committing themselves in, in very, very passionate ways to positions, which quite frankly, while there may be something to them, uh, people are getting a little bit to, uh, too well they're, they're taking themselves too seriously so so fire robin is trying to piss people off he's trying to piss off the scientific establishment the philosophical establishment uh, so for example at various points in his career he has he has written things and said things in support of creationism but not because he's a creationist he is not a creationist he actually thinks that he, he's, he's not religious at all and he thinks that creationism is kind of silly but he likes to nettle the devotees of evolution he likes to see how upset they get when someone questions their ideas uh, and again it, it, this, the, the lesson he's trying to get at here is not we should take creationism seriously but we have to recognize that no view should be immune to to, to, to critical scrutiny even a scientific view which is as well established as as, as Darwinian evolution so uh, um, I want to be clear here Feyerabend is not opposed to science. Uh, he is very much a champion of science, but he does think that science has dangerous and problematic aspects, epistemically problematic aspects. There's a kind of dogmatic arrogance that can come along with science, with, with, with people who think that they fully understand reality, they fully understand the world, and anyone who doesn't see it their way is benighted and ignorant and foolish. And Feyerabend thinks, again, when you study the history of science, that that's not the attitude you should come away with. Again, it's worth remembering here that, that Isaac Newton's uh, theory of physics, Newtonian mechanics, was dominant for 250 years until it was basically disproven by Albert Einstein. That, that should give us some epistemic humility. That should make us say that no matter how confident we are in our theories, it's always possible that we might be wrong. So if I were to summarize uh, Feyerabend's message uh, to, to the science world in general, it would be don't take yourselves so seriously. Don't think that you are the end-all be-all, that your ideas are the best. Recognize that you too are no better than Isaac Newton and your ideas, no matter how confident you are in them, very well might turn out to be wrong. And th that's not just sort of, you know, sort of abstract advice. That's something we should carry through to us in our day-to-day -day lives, in our day-to-day -day practicing as scientists, philosophers, and citizens. Now, um, let's go to back to, to, to Galileo as an illustration. Galileo is one of Feyerabend's huge heroes. Uh, he, he loves many things about Galileo, and he has this sort of heroic picture of him, of standing up to the tyranny of, uh, of, the, of the Catholic Church. Um, you know, Galileo's biography is a fascinating one, which, can, which can, of course can be told from many different perspectives. Um, but suffice to say, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's enough to recognize that he was putting himself in a fair bit of danger personally, politically, economically, uh, by advocating for the heliocentric view of the solar system against the dominant geocentric view, which was defended by the church. Now, as Feyerabend sees it, there's been a role reversal in society. And now science has sort of become the new church, um, or maybe not science as such, but certain aspects of science, certain scientists, certain schools of scientific thought uh, ha have come into this position where they have, are now sort of oppressing anyone who disagrees with their conclusions. Uh, they, they're, they're shouted down as fanatical or, 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 or sort of people who are somehow a danger to society because they refuse to see things from a scientific point of view. And th this is the kind of thing which makes Feyerabend uh, suggest that there's something wrong going on here. Science should not suppress creativity and imagination. It should not insist on any kind of dogmatic adherence to any sort of particular view. It should welcome critical scrutiny of everything, of, of, of global warming, of evolutionary theory, of relativity. Um, it, it, it should not insist that everyone thinks and believes the exact same things or uses the exact same methods or tools or approaches to the world. Um, now again, this is not to say that we, we should take any crackpot idea that anyone proposes and put it on equal footing with the ideas of established science, but it is to say that we should never uh, completely wall ourselves off from the ramblings of madmen, because even the ramblings of madmen can sometimes have sage wisdom in it. 
Now, I think there, from, from a sociological point of view, Fire Robin is onto something here, and that is that science can, as an institutional practice, can be just as intolerant of dissent as any other religion. At its best, I think it is not so intolerant. At, be at, at its best, it does welcome dissent and disagreement. But oftentimes, science fails to live up to that ideal. Scientists can be self-righteous and arrogant, uh, and and they can come across as as intellectual bullies. And this is bad for society and for science because if laymen see scientists as intellectual bullies, as throwing their weight around and insisting that everybody uh, agrees with what they agree, even if they're right, even if they're, they they have the sort of the good evidence behind them, even if they got the good solid foundations, people are and quite frankly should react against that kind of attitude with a big kind of if if you don't mind. My I say, fuck you, buddy. I'm not going to do what you say just because you say it. Uh, there is something in the human spirit that just wants to rebel against that kind of tyranny, that kind of authoritarianism. When anyone comes in and says, we know the truth, we know what's what, we've got uh, all the answers, uh, human beings will want to rebel against that, and frankly, they should want to rebel against that. The free-minded, open, creative spirit is something that should uh, be embraced by science, not something that science should try to stifle. Um, and again, obviously there's something of a tightrope to be walked here. And I, again, I suspect that Feyerabend actually isn't as sort of radical, crazy, anything goes as he, he makes himself out to be. He just thinks that the, the balance has tipped a little too far in the opposite direction, so he's trying to act as a counterweight. So, so, so striking the balance between openness and creativity and sort of rule structured thought is a, is, is a difficult one for any sort of uh, you know group gr collective group of science scientists working in an area together um, so, uh, so so take fire Robin here again like I say with a grain of salt he's probably not uh, uh, doesn't probably literally mean that the the science has become the new church but he wants to warn against that possibility because uh, it, 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 we should not fall prey to the illusion that science is always going to be uh, champions of open-mindedness and critical thought uh, it can be that it often is that but other times it's not and fire robin here is giving us a warning about this so let's go back to galileo again because galileo i think is, is again probably the, the the best illustration of uh, fire robin's thinking here now sort of the the, the the one common history of galileo sees galileo as someone who used observation to overcome religious dogma and if you've been following my series up to this point you recognize that that's not strictly speaking entirely true yes obviously there was a religious element to the to the debate surrounding galileo's uh, 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 ideas and the geocentric versus heliocentric views of the solar system but it's nowhere near as simple as science versus religion or observation versus religion. Feyerabend actually says that the observations that existed at the time actually were opposed to Galileo. There was good empirical evidence to suggest that Galileo was wrong. For example, um, uh, using the, the telescopes that existed at the time, you could not see a parallax. That is, you know, when, when the sun is on, excuse me, when the Earth is on one side of the sun versus being on the other side of the sun, the relative positions of the stars and the heavens should shift and move around. We can see that with today's telescopes, but Galileo's telescopes were not powerful enough to see that. Um, there's also the fact that you know when, when you drop a stone from the top of a tower, if the Earth is moving, it sort of you know it, it, you would think that the top, the stone would fall further away from the base of the tower because the Earth and the tower move away from it as it falls, but you don't see that. Um, again, there's there's a, actually a fairly long list of empirical reasons that existed at the time for thinking that Galileo was wrong, and many of his fellow scientists pointed to those empirical reasons to resist the heliocentric view of the solar system. There was good observational empirical reasons at at the time for thinking that Galileo was wrong. But theory also opposed Galileo. I mean, the dominant theories at the time came from the astronomers like Ptolemy, and then, of course, Aristotle, who endorsed Ptolemy's view. There was a fairly well-established body of theoretical work uh, uh, built on this geocentric view of the solar system, which was well-established and had been produced lots of really good scientific and astronomical work in the time. Um, and then, furthermore, the scientific community at large also opposed Galileo. Sci Galileo's view was a radical upstart view. I mean, you know, the, the, obviously there was, uh, uh, he wasn't completely alone. Before him there were Copernicus, of course, um, uh, and Giordano Bruno and a number of other people who, who sort of sided with that, with that sort of Copernican view. But the, the, the scientific community as a whole was very clearly uh, on board with the geocentric paradigm. So what that means, as Feyerabend reads the history, is that theory 
observation and community were all wrong. Galileo was right, but there was no existing scientific method at the time that could account for that. Again, you can take it from an empiricist point of view, from a logical positivist point of view, from a Popperian point of view, from a Kuhnian point of view. You name whatever sort of philosophy of science you want to take, whatever sort of scientific method you want to propose. Galileo did not abide by that method. Galileo was right, and all these other methods, had we followed them the way it's, their champions suggest we should follow them, w uh, would have led us to stick with the geocentric view. You can see why Fire Robin is going to like a story like this, right? Galileo here is the rebel spirit. Galileo is the anarchist who says, I don't care what your methods say. I have an idea that I think is right, and I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to follow it. Galileo, in doing this, creates a new way of looking at the world, a new way of describing the world. So, for, again, th this is science at its absolute best in Fire Robin's mind. Science, when it's best, doesn't just follow observation where it leads. It challenges observation. It tells you the way you're looking at the world is wrong. You have to overcome your observations. You have to do violence to your own senses to see the world in a new way. And that's when it's eye-opening and awe-inspiring and amazing, and that is science at its best, and that is what scientists should be striving for. We should want to be the next Galileo. We should want to be the next revolutionary spirit. We shouldn't simply want to catalog and record and write down, you know, this this many details and uh, or, uh, this many uh, micro measurements. That's that's drudge work. That's not what we should inspire aspire for. That's not what makes science great. What makes science great is the revolutionary spirit of people like Galileo. Now, uh, I've given the quote before uh, in this class and in this lecture series that Einstein said long before he actually tested his general theory of relativity that he knew it was true because, quote, it was so beautiful. It has to be true because it's so beautiful. And I highlight that because it seems so odd, such an odd thing for a scientist to say. You know, we typically think of scientists as you know, just, just following the evidence, not really caring about the aesthetics of a theory. Um, uh, that's something that uh, it doesn't seem like a typical way of thinking about the scientific spirit. But Feyerabend thinks that this actually is the best of science right here. Now, note, it does, this isn't to say that because a theory is beautiful, it necessarily must be true. Obviously, beautiful theories can and have been false and will continue to be false. But a beautiful theory is valuable even if it is false. Uh, in fact, a beautiful theory can be even more valuable than a plausible theory. I mean, again, it's worth noting that plausible theories very often aren't true as well. Right? So a, a plausible theory might make a lot of sense on paper, but when you go out into the world to test it, it doesn't work at all. Uh, Aristotle's mechanics is probably the best example of this. Um, so, so plausibility isn't necessarily the, the end-all be-all of scientific value either. Uh, and oftentimes, implausible theories, in fact, even false theories, can be very helpful in science. So rather than simply going out and trying to find the true theory, we should be interested more in coming up with sort of creative and novel ways of understanding the world in which we live, of looking at the world in different ways. Even if those ways turn out to be wrong or mistaken or flawed in some way, they can still be illuminating to us. Competition between different theories, different schools of thought, can reveal strengths and weaknesses that we otherwise wouldn't notice. Um, again, don't take what I'm about to say here in the wrong way, but uh, one of the, the, I think, the real benefits that things like intelligent design has had for evolutionary science is they've pointed to, uh, the proponents of uh, intelligent design have pointed to things which we did not have very good evolutionary per, uh, stories to explain, and, and by pointing these out, they inspired scientists working in the Dar Darwinian paradigm to go in and explore and dis and learn new things about the world. So even the gadflies of intelligent design and creationism can actually be beneficial to science. And again, Fire Robin, I think, in his champion of, of creationism, championing of creationism, is, is very much sort of on board with this. We want people to challenge their ideas. We want people who are willing to go against the dominant paradigm. Uh, as Kuhn told the story, right, you know, we, 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 we do normal science, normal science until the anomalies build up and eventually we get to a crisis. And that's when everything goes into chaos. Fire Robin is saying, why wait for the crisis? Why not embrace the chaos out of the side, uh, 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 right outside the gates just to get things running? Because it will be interesting. Now, even if the ideas that we embrace in this sort of chaotic spirit end up being wrong and mistaken, like creationism almost certainly is, it can lead to new insights. And that can be valuable for science and for society to, 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 to follow forward and to try to embrace.